The Las Vegas Raiders have done really well in primetime games as of late, and they're really going to have to step it up here tonight against the LA Chargers if they want a shot at making the AFC playoffs. They're going to be facing the Chargers and a front runner of the Offensive Rookie of the Year award, Justin Herbert. The Most Valuable Player of the Year award has yet to be determined. It's still a toss-up. People are debating, will it be Patrick Mahomes or Aaron Rodgers? Someone who has never won an MVP in their career but has been in the conversation, Drew Brees is 41 years old. Will this be the final season of his NFL career? Unlike Brees, Matthew Stafford may not be playing his final season of his career, but maybe his final season in Detroit. Is Stafford on his way out with the Detroit Lions? All of that plus Week 15 news and notes around the NFL much more to discuss on a brand new episode on Time to Football. Hello, everyone. Thank you guys for joining us for this Thursday night pregame show. I'm your host of this wonderful show, Hassan Khan. Thank you guys for, for joining us. If you're premiering this video on YouTube, how you guys doing? You guys can chat with me as I'm joining you guys with in the chat and premiering this live on YouTube right before the Thursday night game. It's the Fantasy Football Playoffs. Congratulations if you've made it this far. For many of you, it's your semifinals. For some of you, you guys have a two-week championship. You don't like to play Week 17, and you just treat Week 15 and Week 16 as a two-week championship. So if you're in the championship or in your semifinals, whatever it may be, if you made it this far in your fantasy playoffs, congratulations. I'm here to help you guys out. So ask any sort of questions that you may have, any doubt, because we all need second opinions at this point. We all need it from everyone. So everyone interact, ask questions. And I try my absolute best to respond to you guys. And throughout the whole entire duration, I'm going to be joining you guys in the chat. And this is the best way to reach me and ask your questions. Another way that you guys can reach me is through Instagram or social media. And I want to go ahead and tell you guys a story about one of our listeners, one of our followers, one of our viewers, Miguel. If you are joining us on this episode right now in the chat, what's up, Miguel? How you doing? You said you're going to be joining us, but uh, I just want to go ahead and share his story with you guys. So he actually lives in Puerto Rico. He doesn't know, before the season, he didn't know much about football. He was still trying to pick up on the rules. He didn't know a lot about the players either. And so he was messaging me because all of his friends somehow, some way just got together and created a fantasy football league. I think it was through his work. And he messaged me about advice like, hey, man, which player is good? Which player is bad? Who should I trade away? Who should I add? Who should I drop? Who should I start? Who should I sit? And he was slowly picking up on the rules throughout the entire season. So, uh, Miguel, that's an amazing story. You actually, uh, he has a new favorite team now because Justin Herbert was the quarterback for his team. So now Justin Herbert is his favorite player. And the LA Chargers who are playing here tonight on Thursday Night Football are actually his favorite team as well. So that's actually an awesome story. And I love hearing stories like that. So Miguel, thank you for reaching out to me and making me your source of fantasy football information. We may not have won a fantasy football championship this season, but I promise you, stick with me, keep watching. And then next season, 2021, it'll be the year for Miguel and winning a fantasy football championship. So thank you for, for being a lawyer, uh, a loyal follower. Uh, if you're listening to us on the audio experience, thank you guys. Just be sure to go over to YouTube, youtube.com slash time to football, subscribe to us and, and view our videos on there. We come out with much more content on our YouTube channel. All those topics and news and notes that we got to talk about. But first, before we get into it, you know what we have to do every single week if you watch this podcast. It is giving the most prestigious award to a player every week, the hungriest player of the week. Hungriest player of the week, the one that wanted it the most. Who played the most hungriest? The one that really stepped it up and helped lead their team to a victory. There's only one man, and it was from that candidate for the game of the season between the Browns and the Ravens, the quarterback of the Baltimore Ravens, not Trace McSorley, but Lamar Jackson. I know, McSorley the GOAT, I understand, but we had to give it to the uh, uh, the backup Lamar Jackson. Amazing game. Ama- 47-42 was the final score, and... If you guys watched that game, if you had the opportunity to stay up on Monday night, you were not disappointed at all. And Lamar Jackson did not disappoint with his performance. 163 passing yards, three total touchdowns, one passing, two rushing, nine carries for 124 rushing yards. But this is what makes him the hungriest. 
That was a back and forth game between the Browns and the Ravens. The Browns looked fantastic. Baker Mayfield airing it out against a tough defense, fantastic. They were just going back and forth, back and forth. And then Lamar Jackson, midway through the game, he suffered a cramp, went and hobbled to the locker room, never to be seen again. I mean, there's the GoPro camera that showed his weird run that he did, but he hobbled on to the to the locker room, had a cramp, and we did not see him at all. And then Trace McSorley comes in, and then towards the end of the game, when the Ravens needed to come back, Trace McSorley gets hurt, falls awkwardly on his knee. No, they have no quarterback. You remember Robert Griffin III in that game against the Pittsburgh Steelers? He got hurt. His hamstring is hurt. He's out. It was just Trace McSorley and Lamar Jackson. McSorley's hurt. Who's your backup quarterback? Who's your emergency quarterback? Then the camera pans to Lamar Jackson. Great job by the ESPN producers to up the intensity and show that shot of Lamar Jackson hobbling out from the sideline. I don't know what he was doing in the locker room. Many speculate that he was taking a poop. That's okay. I used dude wipes, so maybe Lamar Jackson did as well. But Lamar Jackson came back and led the Baltimore Ravens to an amazing 47-42 victory over the Cleveland Browns, getting one step closer to making an AFC playoff appearance. And that is why Lamar Jackson is the hungriest player of the week. Screw you, Checkdown, for stealing my award. Week 15, news and notes to get you caught up before this week's game. Before tonight's game, let's list the inactives for the Raiders. Cleveland Farrell, Jonathan Abram, Damon Arnett, Henry Ruggs. These are all first-rounders from the last two years. They're all going to be inactive for this game against the Chargers. Henry Ruggs actually recently was just placed on the COVID-19 list. And speaking of that COVID-19 list, other names on that list just added this week. Marquise Brown, who stepped up. Came out of nowhere after a, a, a bad season, it seemed like, in the first half of the, of the year. Miles Boykin, two Baltimore Ravens receivers, are going to be inactive this week. And then Ronald Jones was just recently placed on that reserve slash COVID-19 list as well. And it seems like he's going to be inactive in this game against the Atlanta Falcons. Coming off of that reserve and COVID-19 list, DJ Moore, David Johnson, Matt Breida, Andrew Norwell, the offensive lineman for the Jacksonville Jaguars, LaMichael Pirine, the running back, for the Jets, all big names that have been activated off that COVID-19 list. Other names that have been activated and eligible to be playing as early as this weekend, Drew Brees, Greg Olson, John Brown, Julian Edelman, and George Kittle, and Trayvon Diggs actually as well, have been activated off of IR and are eligible to be playing as early as this weekend. I'm looking at these names and I'm like, dude, I had no idea that some of these players would be able to play at all. At in any sort of game for the remainder of the season, but George Kittle was one of those guys, and it seems like he's going to be playing at least at the earliest, maybe next week or the week after. So we're just going to have to wait and see on that. A guy that is doing well for their team, but unfortunately is more than likely not going to be playing this week, Mike Gesicki, the tight end of the Miami Dolphins, may not play because he suffered a separ- separated shoulder, and it looks like he's going to be inactive in that game against the New England Patriots. Alex Smith has not been practicing. He had a calf injury, and he was able to go, according to uh, head coach of the Washington football team, Ron Rivera. Alex Smith was able to go back into the game if anything were to happen to Dwayne Haskins, but they decided to play it safe, sit him out, and his status for this week is unknown against the Seattle Seahawks. Daniel Jones, another injury happening to him. Separate injury. His ankle may not play. His status is uncertain. Coming back, in that game against the Arizona Cardinals after a hamstring injury. And it seems like Colt McCoy might, yet again, get another start for the New York Giants in this game against the Cleveland Browns. Mike McCarthy will return as a head coach of the Dallas Cowboys in 2021. However, the defensive coordinator, Mike Nolan, more than likely will not, according to some sources out there. Jerry Jones is not big on Mike Nolan. Big on Mike McCarthy, but they're going to have to make some defensive changes. And Mike Nolan, is it's going to start with Mike Nolan. A former Dallas Cowboys head coach, Jason Garrett, who's now the offensive coordinator of the New York Giants, has been placed on that COVID-19. Well, I don't think coaches can be placed on that list, but he has COVID-19, so he's going to be inactive. And instead of him calling the plays this week against the Cleveland Browns, it's going to be the former head coach of the Cleveland Browns, Freddie Kitchens, the tight end coach of the New York Giants right now, is going to be calling all the offensive plays for the New York Giants. That's actually Pretty cool and pretty funny. 
uh, and let's see if that's his quote-unquote revenge game and he can do anything with the New York Giants. Lewis Riddick has been interviewing for multiple general manager positions. So the ESPN analyst, a lot of people have been asking, what are his qualifications? Why is he being interviewed by the Detroit Lions, the Houston Texans, and the Atlanta Falcons for their general manager position? Well, after he retired as a player in the, in the late 90s, he served as a pro scout and director of pro personnel. So he has some front office experience and some work behind him. So he's a name under consideration to be hired by three different teams, the Lions, the Texans, and the Falcons. Actually, the Lions are also interviewing Thomas Dimitrov, the former general manager of the Falcons, who was let go with Dan Quinn. And coming from a Falcons fan, Detroit, please do not hire Thomas Dimitrov for your sake, for, for my sake, for the NFC's sake, and making the playoffs. And yeah, sure. Go ahead, tank your team. But Thomas Dimitrov, if you're okay with mediocre pick after mediocre pick in the first round, go ahead and and hire him. Go for it. Thank you for Julio Jones. Thank you for Matt Ryan, but uh, I don't like him. The NFL has approved a formula for a potential 17th game that could be played in the regular season. Not this year, because according to the CBA, they have to the owners have to. Uh, agree on all this in the meeting that they do every year but a 17th game is a possibility and if that were to happen they have a formula in determining who is going to play who if a 17th game were to happen because the schedule for you guys that may not know is determined by multiple things so six out of the 10 game or 16 games are division games you face each division rival twice so that's six games then you have uh, interconference divisions facing each other every year and it just switches up so for instance the nfc west is facing the NFC East. And then you also have uh, someone in the same conference facing another conference division. So the NFC West is facing the AFC East. And there's just a a whole planned out meticulous formula. And and they have this schedule planned out for years to come. But they now have a way to determine who's going to be playing the 17th game. So that would be exciting to see if they were to have a 17th game. I personally don't like it because I like to preserve records. You know, because if we have a 17th game, then it's going to be easy for like passing records and uh, touchdown records and all of that to be broken easily. But hey, I mean, we'll, we'll get used to it. The the safety of the players is what's most important. But those are your week 15 news and notes ahead of this week's games. Moving on to this week's topics for the show. A big discussion in the NFL community is who's going to walk away with that NFL MVP award. Will it be Aaron Rodgers? Or Patrick Mahomes? Let's make a case for each one individually. Aaron Rodgers, 3,600 yards passing, 39 passing touchdowns, which by the way, that 39 passing touchdowns is more than how many punts J.K. Scott has punted for the Green Bay Packers. So the Packers have more passing touchdowns than J.K. Scott has punts. Thank you, Bennett Nygaard, for that little nugget. Four interceptions... 69, nice, 69.6% of his passes completed, 119.7 quarterback rating. That's on pace for 4,500 yards passing and 48 passing touchdowns to five interceptions. Just process, process that for a bit. 48 passing touchdowns to five interceptions. That's better than an 8 to 1 Touchdown to interception ratio. That's incredible. But let's make the case for Patrick Mahomes. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. 4,200 yards passing. 33 passing touchdowns. Five interceptions. 68. Not so nice. 68.4% of his passes completed. 112.3 quarterback rating. That's on pace. For 5,100 yards passing. 41 touchdowns, 6 interceptions. So looking at the stats alone, who's the favorite? I mean, it's, it doesn't take a, a, a smart man to realize that right now, statistically, it's Aaron Rodgers. Now, I'm not saying he's a favorite right now for MVP, but I'm saying statistically, he's having a better season than Patrick Mahomes. That's just how it is. But both are having really good seasons with their respective teams. The vote for the MVP happens before the playoffs. So after the 17th week of the regular season, once the regular season is over, that's when beat writers, Associated Press, all these people that vote for this MVP award, that's when they vote. So 
the postseason success does not factor in to the MVP vote. I'll explain why that's important in just a bit. But I believe it should be, personally, Aaron Rodgers should walk away with that NFL MVP award. I mean, statistically, we already just read off the stats to you guys. That's why it just makes sense for Aaron Rodgers to win the award. But a lot of people are going to make the argument, well, hey, it's the most valuable player. It's about who is the most valuable to their team. That, that's who should win the NFL MVP. The only thing about that, about that argument, about who is the most valuable, is that there is no level of consistency with that argument. What I mean by that is an MVP award should be an individual performance-based award. So if you are the best performing player, you deserve to be the MVP of the league. That's just how it is, and that's how it should be. But a lot of people get it twisted and confused. No, it's about who's the most valuable. Like, if you take this player away from this team, they're not going to be that good. First off, to argue that, you don't really know that. Unless that player got hurt earlier in the season, then you and you saw that the team suffered without them, you can't really make a judgment call on, is this team really that good without them? You just can't. I mean, yes, in your mind, you could say yes, like, Obviously, like, look how good Patrick Mahomes is. If you took him away from the Chiefs, you're not going to be as good with whoever the backup quarterback is. Yes, I understand what you're saying, but, like, factually and statistically, you there's no way of determining that. There's just no evidence. So that gets thrown out the window just because there's no evidence. So you have to look at who is the best performing, and you have to measure that by their statistics because there has to be consistency. A lot of people vote on who the most valuable player is based off of who is the most valuable, not off of who had the most stats. Because in 2014, speaking of Aaron Rodgers, if you remember when Aaron Rodgers won that MVP award over J.J. Watt, which was the biggest upset in MVP and NFL MVP history, it should have been J.J. Watt. People gave him the award and people voted for him because number one, quarterback bias, because people believe that the MVP is just based off of who the best quarterback is. It shouldn't be like that, but that, that's just how it is nowadays. And two, they chose Rodgers because he was the most valuable over J.J. Watt, who had a historic year. I mean, 20 and a half sacks, 78 tackles for a defensive end is pretty freaking good. Five touchdowns, three of them were on offense as a defensive end. And he didn't win MVP because they decided to go with who was the most valuable. Let me counter that by asking you this question. If you want to pick who the most valuable player is over who the st- statistically who the best player is, shouldn't it be someone like Russell Wilson? I mean, if you take Russell Wilson away from the Seattle Seahawks, they're not going to be as good with Geno Smith. I mean, we've seen this in the last, I, I guess, a couple years ago, before they had DK Metcalf, before they had a solid run game, before Tyler Lockett was on the up and coming. Russell Wilson did it all by himself He was the man, he was the leading guy with 34 passing touchdowns with nothing around him. Wasn't he the most valuable? Yet he didn't earn a single MVP vote. So he was the most valuable, he had great stats, and he led his team to a winning record and made the postseason. Yet he didn't get a single MVP vote. You see where I'm getting at? There's just too many inconsistencies with the MVP voting. Do you vote for the most valuable like you did with Aaron Rodgers over J.J. Watt, who had the better stats? Or do you go with someone who has the better stats over someone like Russell Wilson, who was the most valuable to their team that season? I personally believe that MVP is an individual award. Who balled out individually? Take team success away. And you have to award it to the guy who had the best statistics, the best player, the best performances, and that, in my eyes, it's got to be Aaron Rodgers. Statistically, looking at it, Aaron Rodgers over Patrick Mahomes. Patrick Mahomes is very valuable to his team, I understand, but if if this is an individual award, it's got to be Aaron Rodgers. If they vote for this award before the postseason, on purpose, by the way, they they vote for this award before the postseason because, number one, not every team makes the postseason. And number two, they want to make sure that they award the best 
player outside of their team's success. Before the postseason, before you make that Super Bowl run, before that changes your mind on who the NFL MVP is, they want to go ahead and award the NFL MVP for the regular season. So if you want to take team success away, as you should, you have to be consistent with it. You can't just give it to the most valuable player. You have to give it to the best statistically performing individual most deserving player who balled out for that year, and that's got to be Aaron Rodgers in my eyes. But leave your comments, leave your thoughts, leave your opinions. Who do you believe should be NFL MVP, and do you agree or disagree with the NFL MVP voting process or the thinking behind the voting process? An MVP candidate who never won the award he should have in 2009 over Peyton Manning, but that's okay. Let's just not get into it. Drew Brees is 41 years old on the tail end of his career, on the final leg. And that could mean a lot of things. That could mean final three years, two years, one year, three games. It's a possibility. Mainly because of the comments that head coach Sean Payton made in an interview. I'm going to go ahead and pull that quote up and put it up on the screen as well. This is what he said about Jameis Winston, Taysom Hill, and the quarterback future after Drew Brees. He stated, one of the attractions for Jameis, and I understand it, was there aren't many places in free agency where you can go to a team and have a pretty good bet that that quarterback like Drew is going to be playing in his last year. Peyton told the NFL's Huddle and Flow podcast, that doesn't exist. You go to a team and you're going to look for that opportunity to sometime be a starter. He's going to have that opportunity the minute Drew leaves. And both he and Taysom know that. So I'm going to pause right there because I want to go back and see what he said about Drew Brees' last year. Talking about Jameis Winston, about how the Saints were an attraction to sign because you don't get the opportunity to sign with a team where you're behind a quarterback like Drew who's going to be playing in his last year. Did he spill the beans? I don't know. We still don't know yet. And Drew Brees probably still does not know yet either. He's probably going to take a couple months after the season to really sit down and make that decision before he decides to move on. And the postseason as well is going to determine his thought process into that decision as well. But Sean Payton, mentally, is he thinking, oh man, yeah, Drew Brees is on this last leg of his career, but is that leg going to be ending Sometime soon, as early as 2021, will we have a new starting quarterback for the New Orleans Saints? Permanent starting quarterback. Let me go back and finish that quote. So it just talks a little bit about uh, Winston signed a one-year, $1.1 million deal. So if they want to keep in New Orleans, they have to resign him. But this is what he had to say. I've been proud of how that room has handled it, Jameis particularly, because he's a competitor and he wants that opportunity, Peyton said. And listen, I feel like, and I said it a week ago, I feel like our next quarterback is in the building. It's Taysom Hill or Jameis Winston, according to Sean Payton. Why is that big news? Why does that tie into Drew Brees potentially retiring after this season? Talking about Taysom Hill, he's 30 years old. We'll be 31 next season as a starting quarterback of the Saints. He's been doing pretty well for the Saints as the starting quarterback, but in that four games that he's had in replacing Drew Brees, 72% of his passes completed, four passing touchdowns, two interceptions, 96.9 quarterback rating, and he's been rushing the ball a lot. 209 rushing yards, four rushing touchdowns. Pretty solid, and a 4-0 record for the Saints as well with Hill as a starting quarterback. They're confident in him, and they're okay with him being the starting quarterback for the time being and giving Drew Brees as much time as as he needs to heal before he makes the decision to take him out and put Brees back in. But if you look on what he's on pace to finish the season with, 16 passing touchdowns to 8 interceptions. He isn't known as this prolific, greatest passer in the NFL. Taysom Hill is, at least. He's better known as his rushing ability. He's better known as the guy that came in for Sean Payton and led the team to a 4-0 record. How long is that going to last, though? Do you really want someone that isn't known for their passing ability and... 
maybe this is true, maybe this isn't true. Maybe NFL teams could expose him. Maybe NFL teams could shut him down. And then all of a sudden, Hill is no longer relevant in the NFL. Or do you go with a guy like Jameis Winston, who is known for his passing ability, the most realistic option for the Saints. He's almost 27 years old. In just a few days, he's going to be turned 27. And that's proven that he can't pass the ball. He just needs to fix some mistakes here and there and throw a lot less interceptions for the Saints. Regardless, Sean Payton believes that the quarterback of the future is in the locker room. They're not going to be bringing in another guy, maybe like Carson Wentz, or they might draft another quarterback, a young guy, but another veteran. He doesn't believe it's going to be the possibility of bringing them in and replacing Drew Brees at all. But those words by Sean Payton, it was head-scratching. And a lot of guys have come out and said, yeah, they, we believe this is Drew Brees' last season. For instance, Brett Favre, who's been in that road of retiring, then unretiring, retiring. He believes if if he can get in the head of Drew Brees and has any sort of say, which I would trust his words based off of his experience of retiring, he's saying that, yeah, more than likely this could be Drew Brees' last season. So uh, leave your comments. Do you believe that Brees is done after this year? Another quarterback that is in the conversation of moving on, not so much in his NFL career retiring, but to an other NFL team, Matthew Stafford has been in the conversation of leaving Detroit. Are the Lions moving on with Matt Stafford? Chad Brown, I don't know exactly who that is, but Chad Brown said on 104.3 The Fan in Denver that the Lions plan on moving on from Stafford. This is the... The talk of the town, the rumors that are spreading around that the Lions no longer have the vision of Matthew Stafford being their starting quarterback. We gave you 12 seasons in Detroit to do what you wanted to do. You had three playoff appearances, never won a playoff game. Just didn't work out. We think you're a good player, but we just want to move on and go ahead and get a quarterback of the future and get a younger guy and invest in him. Understandable. And we can see both sides of it. Let's talk a little bit about why it could be true that Matthew Stafford could no longer be a Detroit Lion. Three years left on his contract, a lot of money, a lot of money. So it would make a lot of sense for the Lions to move on with the contract. I don't know if another NFL team is going to be willing to trade for that contract and pick up the slack and pay that much money. But if they release them, yeah, they have to pay a little bit of uh, money up front and a little bit of dead space and dead money. But it, it would financially be the best decision at the end of the day to move on with Matthew Stafford with three years left on his contract, knowing that you want to move on with him as soon as possible. But here's a reason on why it may not be true. Because they still don't know who their general manager and their head coach is. They don't. The favorite right now is Robert Sala, the defensive coordinator of the San Francisco 49ers. But we don't know his thinking. We don't know if he wants to keep Matthew Stafford or not. We do, we just don't know. So it's kind of iffy to, to, to believe the words of this uh, supposed Chad Brown that Matthew Stafford is going to be leaving because we don't know who the general manager and the head coach is who makes those decisions just yet. But so why would they be discussing internally on whether to not, whether or not to move on? I don't know yet, but that's probably one of the reasons why you may not want to put too much stock into it. However, on the show, we like to talk about what if, so what if Matthew Stafford were to move on to another team? What are some candidates to land Matthew Stafford as a quarterback in 2021. The Indianapolis Colts are the first ones to uh, come to people's minds that they need a quarterback, mainly because they signed Philip Rivers to a one-year $25 million contract. And Rivers, yeah, he's been productive. He's been good. He's been solid. But they just, you know, because of his age and because of they really don't see much future and much time for Philip Rivers, they could be moving on. Even though Matthew Stafford is in his early 30s and you may not want to do that. And that's probably a reason why the Colts may not want Matthew Stafford. They may just elect to go with a younger guy. Someone like Carson Wentz, who could be traded this offseason from the Philadelphia Eagles. He's much younger than Matthew Stafford. Much, much younger than Phillip Rivers. And I don't believe that the Colts are convinced in signing another veteran. They already tried that this year with Phillip Rivers. They're going to move on with him. Uh... Maybe they'll re-sign him. I'm not sure yet. But if they decided to move on with Phillip Rivers, I don't think that Matthew Stafford bringing in another uh, seasoned veteran like Matthew Stafford would be the move. Instead, someone that has a little bit of experience, like Carson Wentz, maybe a bit older than someone that you can get in the NFL draft, could be an option. But I, I don't see it happening with the Indianapolis Colts. The New England Patriots 
Another team that may need some quarterback help with uh, Cam Newton being a, oh man, that did not work out at well with Cam Newton in New England. But this is another example of we just don't see this happening of Matthew Stafford going to the New England Patriots because Bill Belichick in his head, he's thinking we got to go ahead and start getting quarterbacks that are going to be younger and start developing, developing them for the future. And they don't want to go ahead and go with the same scenario of bringing in another veteran. They tried it with Cam Newton to be a bridge quarterback to last him for the time being, and it just did not work out. So Matthew Stafford, I don't see him going to the Patriots. Another team that could use a quarterback, the Jacksonville Jaguars. I don't understand why Gardner Minshew gets so much hate when statistically he's not as bad as you may think. Uh, but they they want to go ahead and move on. And I don't see this happening for Matthew Stafford as well, because they draft way too high for them to trade or sign Matthew Stafford. They draft what we presume to be the number two overall pick, and what we presume is they would draft a quarterback at that point. So, and they already tried the veteran thing with Nick Foles, and it just it just didn't work out. The last team that could use or is in dire need of a quarterback, the Chicago Bears. Again, another example where I don't see Matthew Stafford going to the Chicago Bears. They tried it again. It goes back to the veteran thing. They tried it again with Nick Foles. They brought in a guy, and it's just... And Nick Foles is going to be moving on for sure. And I don't think they're going to bring in another veteran and try that experiment again with Matt Nagy. Instead, I think he's going to bring in a younger guy through the draft or uh, potentially trade for a younger guy as well. So... uh, you look at these teams, these potential teams that could use quarterbacks, all four of these, the Colts, the Patriots, the Jaguars, the Bears, and none of these are possible, realistic possibilities for Matthew Stafford to play in. It's going to be tough. And for Stafford, if he does move on from Detroit or if they release him, if they trade him, whatever it may be, yeah, he might be a starter here and there for a couple games, three games, four games, but more than likely this might be his last opportunity this season to be a starting quarterback in the NFL, at least for the next year or two. But leave your thoughts down below. What do you feel like is going to happen with the future of Matthew Stafford? To wrap things up, we've got fantasy football questions that you guys ask every single week on this show. Make sure you guys chat and leave your comments and I'm answering any sort of questions that you may have and also hit me up on social media as well. The first question that you guys left on that Sorts and Sets video that I wanted to answer, this is by Jago, J, J Got Game. Oh, okay. J Got Game 96. Why is Dustin Hopkins a set? He's been the most consistent kicker in the league in the past weeks. Yeah, understandable. He's been solid. And he's going to be a, a hot waiver wire ad as well if you're in, into, you know, projecting and predicting kickers uh, in that game. So Dustin Hopkins has been great, especially in that game against the Pittsburgh Steelers. But here's the thing. I said this in preseason when I was talking about uh, my preseason standings, preseason rankings for the fantasy football draft. Kicker is the one position where you're so reliant on the team around you. You're only as good as a team around you. And with Alex Smith potentially getting hurt, with Dwayne Haskins having to go inside the game... I don't think that there's going to be much opportunity against the Seahawks defense to move the ball down the field the, down the field and get into field goal range. So I don't think Dustin Hopkins is a very reliable kicker this week in fantasy football, especially in the fantasy playoffs when you just don't want to risk a lot and you want to play it safe and choose the best options. Dustin Hopkins is not that guy. This next one is from Jim Shu 1234 Should I start DK Miles Sanders or Swift. DK is solid. Wide receiver one, I would start him over Sanders and Swift. Sanders, if you took away that ridiculous 82-yard touchdown run that he had against the New Orleans Saints, he would have ran for 13 carries on 33 yards. Or 33 yards on 13 carries. DeAndre Swift, on the other hand, I like him a lot. Very talented back in next year. I believe he's going to be a first or second rounder I believe he's going to be that talented. He's just splitting too much time with uh, the backfield in Detroit with Adrian Peterson and Kerryon Johnson, which I never understood. Just give the reins to DeAndre Swift, man. He's the most talented player. Just give the give the ball to him every single down, you know. But 
Swift and Miles Sanders, because of uh, the production that Sanders has been having as of late and because of uh, the opportunities that Swift has lacked in and having to split that time, DK Metcalf is the best option at that point. Next one, C Lane asks, great vid as always. There are a few things though. How is Hurts, a mobile quarterback, a possible bust? How is AB, Antonio Brown, a start when he hasn't done much so far? How is Tim Patrick, a set at home? Thanks and good luck. Okay, so three questions in one. So starting off with Hurts. So many rookie quarterbacks tend to do well at their debut, and he looked great against a fantastic defense in the New Orleans Saints. He threw the ball away. Just pause right there. An Eagles quarterback threw the ball away when he was pressured. Very important. And he was mobile. So he was, a lot, he was able to get a lot of fantasy points and, and get it done in the ground game. But what happens is as the season progresses, as coaches get more and more film on a rookie quarterback, once they play the first game, oh, we already have film on you. It exists. Film of you in the NFL. We know how you operate now. We know how you do under pressure against an NFL defense. We can game plan accordingly. And the Cardinals are going to be that team that game plans accordingly. I don't see them shutting out Jalen Hurts completely. I still feel like because of the potential that Jalen Hurts has in the ground game, running the ball, yes, he'll be okay. He'll be average. But I don't see him getting more than maybe 16 fantasy points this week. Antonio Brown is a start because he's the most targeted wide receiver, it seems like, after Mike Evans. I think he's taken a step up over Chris Godwin at this point, being targeted way more than Chris Godwin in recent weeks. And last week he had five receptions, didn't really do much out of it. But if he just continues to see these targets slowly but surely, he's going to go ahead and pop off and Antonio Brown is going to be that wide receiver two in Tampa Bay behind Mike Evans. How is Tim Patrick a sit at home? So at home, I don't really feel like it really matters that much with the lack of a crowd. Maybe in Denver, they have a little bit of a crowd, but I don't really think it matters way too much. But I think Tim Patrick is a sit because he's only had one game this season with more than six receptions. That does give you a lot of promise and a lot of optimism in starting Tim Patrick. Instead, KJ Hamler, who's been up and coming, has been emerged in that one game against the Carolina Panthers last week. He's going to be splitting targets with Jerry Judy as well. KJ Hamler, uh, this is a bad matchup for, for someone like Drew Locke. And I, I just don't see the possibility of Tim Patrick doing as well as he has been doing. He's been consistent, yes, but I just don't see Tim Patrick putting up more than maybe 10 half PPR points. So I'm going to go ahead and pass up on all three of those. Uh, James Cadzo asks, I need one flex in PPR. So close. Jacobs. Montgomery, Sanders, Swift, Carson. Is that your running back room? You have to you have to decide between those guys because that's loaded, and I would kill for a running back group like that. But nonetheless, which of these players would you start? So I just made the case for Sanders and Swift. Swift splits carries way too much. Sanders not as productive as he used to be. Montgomery could be productive, has been productive in recent weeks, but there's still that that factor of Montgomery just you know being on and off on and off all season long and I don't know how much you can really trust that so because of the trust factor you may not want to go with Montgomery Carson and Jacobs make a lot of sense and I would start both of them oh man if I had to start either one of them I know that you're going to be I don't know if you're going to see this in time in that game against the Chargers but um, I would go with Jacobs I would because that Washington run defense is pretty tough and Chris Carson might be suffering with that. And plus he does split some time as well with Carlos Hyde and uh, all the other running backs that they have there. So uh, Josh Jacobs would be my, op- be my option to start. And if you don't see this in time before tonight's game, then start Chris Carson. You wouldn't be mad about that. Uh, let's do a few more. We've got uh, David Hess asks San Francisco or Tampa Bay. Uh, talking about the defense, which one should I start? So San Francisco is one of my must starts. Tampa Bay, he says, sack machine allows least rushing yards in NFL. Julio likely out. Yeah, and Todd Gilly has not been looking that good as well. I understand why you would want to start Tampa Bay. And Matt Ryan has not been looking that great as well. But the, there's unpredictability with Matt Ryan that comes with them. Sometimes he's good, sometimes he's bad. 
And recently, he's just been bad for a string of games. And especially Julio Jones is now week to week, and he might be missing this game as well. But that pass defense of Tampa Bay has not been looking that good as well. So because of the unpredictability aspect of it, I'm going to go with something that, or a defense that I would trust way more, and that is San Francisco. Next one is from Scott Kazmir. Ayuk or Hilton? Again, this is the fantasy playoffs. This comes down to trust. I have Hilton as a start this week because of the games that he's been having in the last three weeks. But at any point, because of the beginning half of the season, he was doing nothing. And at any point, he may go back to doing nothing at all. Whereas Ayuk, even with Debo Samuel in there, with Samuel in there or not, Ayuk has been productive, especially when Debo isn't in there. He's a go-to guy. So I'm going to go ahead and start Ayuk over Hilton. But that will do it for this week's episode of Time to Football. And if you guys enjoy this episode, why don't you go ahead and subscribe to this YouTube channel and stay up to date. Hit that bell as well so you can notify when we come out with more videos every single week. If you don't want to watch a 45-minute video on YouTube, understandable. Go over to iTunes. Search us on the podcast app. Uh, search Time to Football and listen to us on the Go Rate and Review 5 Stars nothing less. Hit me up on social media, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. The username for all three is at time to football. Continue to, to, to comment and leave your questions for fantasy football so I can go ahead and give you uh, my insight and my my take on everything. Uh, and so we can you know work well together and you can win that fantasy football championship. But other than that, thank you guys so much for watching this episode. It is week 15 of the 2020 NFL season and Adam Gase is still the head coach of the New York Jets. Enjoy the game, and I'll see you next week.